大家晚上好，欢迎大家来到国际培训大咖五十谈，我是主持人顾立民，欢迎大家。那么上一期呢，我们有请了 Dr. Judy Hale， 我的老朋友，我的老朋友，呃，朱迪赫尔博士给大家进行了一个访谈。那么这个访谈呢，也是内容满满啊。那么其中呢，也是很有很很很有意思的一次访谈，也是内容非常的丰富。那么其中呢，我们我们聊到聊到了什么是 HPT， 就是人力技巧技术和人力技巧改进 HPI 的区别啊，系体系化与系统化 （systemic 和 systematic） 的区别等等，以及呢，如何呃成为一个合格的出色的绩效改进。顾问啊，咨询顾问等等。那么其中呢，呃 ，Dr. Judy Hale 还谈到了一个著名的这个 T model 啊，这个 T model 呢，很多很多朋友呢都非常有感觉啊，跟我提过好几回。呃，所以呢，以后有机会的话呢，呃，跟大家呢来进一步的跟大家进行分享。这也就是这个国际培训大咖五十谈的目的，把所有这些大家们他们最领先的或者是最。呃，广为人知的这些个成果呢，来跟大家进行呈现，然后呢，让供大家来选择，供大家来学习，选择那些最有用的、最高效的，为我所用，能够在你们的工作岗位上，能够，呃，少付出一些代价，少走些弯路，能够更加的高效，更加的直接为业务创造价值啊。那么今天呢，我们又非常的荣幸的请到了另外一位非常重量级的嘉宾，那么他的名字呢叫 Dr. James Klein。克莱恩博士，詹姆斯·克莱恩博士啊，或者叫吉姆·克莱恩博士。那么，呃 ，Jim 呢？他是他现在呢是佛罗里达州立大学，也是佛罗里达州立大学 （FSU Florida State University） 啊，教育学院教育心理学系及学习系统系的系主任。那么这个系呢，也是他们教育学院的这个核心的这个系之一啊，也是。这些大家们啊，曾经工作过的地方，这些大家们包括啊，耳熟能详的，大家请大家看啊，有这个这个 Robert Ganey 啊，还有呢 Roger Kaufman 啊 ，John Keller 啊 ，Bob Morgan，Bob Branson，Bob r e z e r 等等，这些大家们曾经工作过的地方，也是美国著名的教学系统设计的这个重镇啊，理论重镇之一和实践的这个这个基地之一。所以呢，他们呢。呃，这个系的教授们，我们访谈了，特别是访访谈了好几位。那么他将是第五位我们访谈的这个系的，呃呃，这个系的著名的这个这个教授。那么他本人呢，也是这些大家们，啊的。学生之一啊，那么他也是非常出色的一个学生。那么他也已经已经退休，但是现在还在呃回到佛罗里达州立大学呢，担任这个系主任。他是这个呃亚利桑那州立大学的呃这个荣誉的退休教授。那么 Jim 呢，他呃这一天的这次的访谈呢是录播。那么这次录播呢是在什么时候呢？是在九月二十四号。那么今天呢是十月十四号，九月二十四号我们呃录的这一期视频。那么。这次期的视频呢，大家看，呃，正好有一个不幸的事件发生了啊。那么就是我们敬爱的啊，非常大家都非常尊敬的、著名的培训评估之父 Dr. Roger Kaufman 啊，离我们而去了。那么我听到这个消息的时候呢，是在九月二十四号凌晨。那么正好呢，是在九月二十四号的晚上啊。我听到消息比较快。呃，是正好这个事情发生三十分钟之后啊，半个小时左右呢，我就得到了这个消息。那么那天呢，正好呢，呃，下午呢，我上午呢就发发布了朋友圈啊，进行悼念。那么下午呢，就在正好呢，在培训杂志呢有一个展会，我带领着这个两百来位在场的这个观众呢，在培上海的这个培训杂志的展会的现场呢，也进行了一个小小的仪式啊，这个悼念。我们的敬爱的 Roger Kaufman 啊，罗杰·考夫曼博士，他享年是九十岁。那么，呃，我们现场呢默哀了一分钟。那么这晚上的话呢，正好呢又是跟 Jim 来进行的这这一次的访谈，所以在这次访谈当中呢，我们大家看看看啊，看到前面呢也有一个小小的这个默哀的这个致敬的这个一那么一个小的环节。那么这一次的话呢，我们将，呃，对。这个今这次访谈对 Jim 的呃 Dr. Klein 的这个访谈呢也非常的有意思啊，关呃是有这么几个话题，一个呢是 ISD 还是围绕着教学系统设计，也是这个学校最擅长的啊，最最强最强大的教呃教学系统设计的这个基础的这个概念，还有呢呃 performance improvement 教这个绩效改进啊等等，还有呢这个围绕着这个教学呃他们这个整个这个。
program 本身啊，我们也给大家进进行一下这个介绍，其中呢也有不少中国来的和其他国家来的学生啊，还有呢就是说在这个戏里面。他们有这么多的传奇式的人物，在这个领域里面几乎都是奠基式的人物了啊。那么他们如何啊？他们他将如何把这些个宝贵的精神财富和精神遗产传承下去，并将之发扬光大等等这一系列问题呢？我们都请 d r Klein 给我们来进行讲解。好，我们呃，我们下面就隆重有请 d r Jim Klein。Hi, Dr. Klein. How are you? Hello, Dr. Gu. How are you? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll call. We'll call each other first names, and uh, uh, I'll call you Jim, and uh, call me George. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, George. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is uh, thank you. First of all, on behalf of all the viewers uh, in the learning development field in China. And uh, thank you so much for accepting our interview. And this is probably the closest uh, that we can get during the pandemic. It has changed the way we're communicating across the globe. It is. It is. Uh, Jim, just for our client, uh, just for our all of our audiences, will you please introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, tell us uh, where you grew up, where you went to college, what you studied, when uh, where. You, where you live and work now. Sure. Uh, so my name is Jim Klein, and I am the Walter Dick Professor of Instructional Systems Design at Florida State University. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Department of Educational Psychology and Learning Systems. So our Instructional Systems and Learning Technologies program resides in a department. And so I'm the chair of that department with uh, 30 faculty, five staff, and over 400 uh, students, all graduate students, and I am a professor emeritus of Arizona State University. Um, I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, decided from eighth uh, grade on that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a history teacher, and so I began studying history in, in education, and I wasn't a very good high school student. I went on to community college uh, first, at uh, Palm Beach Junior College, and then I went to Florida Atlantic University. Uh, then I taught elementary school for five years before I went back to school. And the reason I left elementary school teaching was because um, there wasn't enough freedom. Everybody was always telling me how to teach and what to do. And, in fact, they told me the color of magic marker that I needed to have on my charts. And so I decided that I wanted to go back and teach teachers how to be better teachers. Now, I really wasn't sure what it meant to be a college professor. I had this vision in my mind, but it was all about teaching. I also wasn't sure exactly what I wanted um, to do because I went from history to elementary school because there were no history jobs at the time, so I taught elementary school. And so I visited all the departments in the College of Education at Florida State University, and I asked them about their program. Well, one August day in Tallahassee, Florida, I met a man by the name of Bob Reeser. And Bob was very enthusiastic. Bob, you know Bob George, so you know how enthusiastic Bob is about everything. And yes. he explained to me mm -hmm. what this field was all about. Mm -hmm. And essentially, he said it's a combination of education, psychology, and communications. Mm -hmm. Well, I had done work uh, when I was at the junior college in radio, and I really thought about going in, a, in, in that direction. So communication was always interesting to me. Psychology, I had already talked to the people in psychology, and then of course education. So Bob invited me to apply to the master's program. I did. And Interestingly enough, I, I knew I wanted, still wanted to get my PhD. Mm -hmm. But at the end of my master's program, Walt Dick said to me, Jim, I'm not mm -hmm. so sure you should go on for your PhD because you're still thinking like a teacher. You're not thinking like a systems person. And I spent the summer reflecting upon whether I should go back to teaching elementary school or whether I should go on for my PhD. 
-hmm. And I came to the conclusion that no, I was going to prove Walt Dick wrong and I was going to get my PhD. That is why I honor Walt Dick with the title of a Walter Dick Professor, because when I had a chance to choose who I would like to honor, he was the guy. Everybody was like, oh, Jim, you're a great student. You said, oh, we love you, Jim. But Walt Dick, who challenged me and said, you need to start thinking like a systems person. So then I graduated from Florida State University in tw uh, uh, 20. It was another, it was another century, George, in 1988. And I moved to Tempe, Arizona, where I became an assistant professor of educational technology at Arizona State University. Mm -hmm. I spent my, I spent 23 years at Arizona State going through the ranks. I, um, assistant professor, associate professor with tenure, full professor. Uh, before I came, became a full professor, I was the editor of etr and um, I was, you know, making a name for myself in, in a small part of the field. AECT, uh, very active in AECT, serves as an officer in that. And then I was having dinner with Marcy Driscoll, who was the dean at the time. And I said to her, Marcy, I'm interested in leaving Arizona State. There was some conflict there. Um, we don't need to get into that, but I wasn't happy at Arizona State. And she found a position for me. And that was a decade ago. And so I'm back at Florida State. And um, I, lo I love it. I love exactly what, what I'm doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And this is... This is uh very, very proven track record of, uh, of systematic improvement. Actually, Walter Dick reminded you and challenged you the system thinking and uh, you did it and did it excellently. I think, I think he, 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 he was very glad that you uh, exceeded his expectations probably. Thank you. And uh, so, uh, Jim, today, uh, today our interview now is a recorded session. Today is September 24th, is 2020. So uh, it is a special day, though, because, because there's a, you know, sad news. And uh, it, is, it is a passing of a doctor, the beloved Dr. Roger Kaufman. And uh, I know that it is, it is a loss to, to our field, and he has been a good, dear friend, good friend, dear friend to both of us, and to all of us, actually. And he's also a, a colleague of yours, and he served in your department. So I, I, I know that in your, uh, in your department, there's a wall of pictures, and he's, he's one of them in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the hallway, like in, uh, in honor of Robert Ganet. And uh, so today is so sudden that that uh, probably it just happened. And uh, I would like to propose that we observe a moment of silence in honor of Dr. Roger Kaufman. Would that be okay? Yes, George, I, th I think that would be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Let's starting from now, it's one minute. Thank you. We'll all remember him. Yeah, Roger is another one of those people that had a very large influence on my life and can, and continues to have a large impact on my life. You know, in terms of that systems thinking, Roger was the one who got me to think in a, in a macro way, um, in, a, in an organizational way. Um, and um, the notion of, of, of outcomes, the notion of, of 
outcomes being at the societal consequence level. You know, how are we making sure that the people we serve are self-sufficient, self-reliant? How are we sure that these people have a high quality of life? And that's what the goal of every educational and, and organizational system should be, whether, whether you're a company, whether you're a school district or a government. And, um, and Roger always pushed us to thinking about the consequences of what we do in the greater society. And I can't think of anybody else that I've met in my life that was dedicated to that as much as Roger Kaufman. Thank you. And uh, yes, uh, Roger is also a, a good a mentor of mine too. Uh, and uh, we, we met, I don't know when, when we started to, to meet each other in person, but um, uh, every time uh, we got into, uh, we, we got the chance and uh, we always have a good talk. He's a, he's a mentor to me. Uh, I never, went, I never uh, had a course with him, but I watch his sh him sharing a lot because we're in the, uh, at the ISPI, at, uh, at ISPI. And uh, this afternoon I was at, uh, uh, at a sharing event. It was a conference held by Training Magazine and with uh, 200 people full. Uh, in the room, so we also observed a moment of silence to remember him, to honor him. And I think, uh, I think, Jim, uh, your gener uh, we, our generation, uh, we are we're lucky enough to we're fortunate enough to stand on the shoulder of the giants, and uh, th those giants are Robert Ganey and and now Roger Kaufman. So we're fortunate enough, and uh, we'll we'll keep marching. Uh, keep marching is a way of to honor them to continue what they have started and to continue to, to, uh, to bring what they have started to a new level. Thanks, George. Thank you. And uh, so uh, let's come back to the questions, uh, Jim. Uh, I know because, because we just mentioned, uh, uh, we just uh, mentioned uh, Roger Kaufman, and now you also just mentioned uh, Bob Reeser, and I just want to let you know that a week ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we we had uh, Bob Reeser on the show, and uh, his interview went went on for two and a half, uh, two hours and uh, fifty minutes, <laughs> and uh, he taught us a lot, especially the IDT, the Instructional System Design and uh, Technology, Instructional Design and Technology. That's the newer name. And he had a book, a series of book about it. And his newer editions year, uh, every around over five years, you know, he has a newer edition coming out. And uh, so I wanna, uh, because you're at Florida State University and you are, pro you are the fifth professor that I'm, I'm interviewing from Florida State. And uh, previously, uh, pre previous, uh, ahead of you, I, Roger, I, I interviewed Roger Kaufman, I, uh, Bob Reeser, John Keller, and Dr. Rob, Bob Branson. Th these are all great names. And uh, so uh, basically, Florida State is an epic center in this field, one of the epic centers in our field. And uh, so I want to take this opportunity to ask you, what is your definition of ISD? So will you please tell us, your, share your version of it. Thank you. Sure. Um, my, my guess is that Reeser talked about what we should call ourselves. And so if that's always been a thing in our, our field, we have an identity crisis. Who are we? What should we be? And so when you think of instructional systems uh, design, it, it's very easy for me to think about, well, is that the right term, first of all? So let me tell you that we call ourselves here instructional systems and learning technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer a broader term, learning instruction and performance systems. And my reasoning for that is that I think performance is such an important part of our, 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 our what we do. And that when right. we say instructional systems design, we're beginning uh, with, with a, 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 an intervention mm -hmm. instead of thinking about what it is we're trying to accomplish and of course our field is is you know i tell my students that we exist because we're interested in facilitating learning and improving performance and that's what whether we call ourselves isd or whether we call ourselves 
learning instruction and performance systems or whatever we call ourselves. To me, that's what ISD is. So by, mm -hmm. by thinking about it, we, we have to break up our individual terms. So we've already talked about instruction as, a, as an intervention. And mm -hmm. I already, you know, we know that instruction is only one intervention. So let's take the next term, systems. You know, systems thinking has to do with, with um, looking at problems and coming up with solutions, trying things out, testing them. I mean, that's mm -hmm. systems thinking to me. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea, again, if we want to be formal about it, we have a goal, we have interrelated parts, they all inter, they, they interact together, the system gets feedback and then self-corrects. So and in a you know, design thinking, again, design thinking is that notion that I'm going to observe my world. I'm going to determine what the problem is, I'm going to come up with solutions, I'm going to test those solutions. And so Instructional system design is part of all of that. Another part of this this whole notion is the term technology, mm -hmm. and I define technology as I think to me the best definition of technology are processes and tools to help humankind. Mm -hmm. And so we we have processes, we have tools, and those tools are are used and the processes and tools are used to advance learning and performance, individual and organizational learning and performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so you, uh, so in your definition, performance system is a very important, is a very important part of our, so, so you extend ISD, the original ISD to perform, to include performance improvement into it. Yes. And, yes. And, and also you think that ISD is an intervention itself. One of the interventions, maybe one of the most important for right. PI. Right. So I, so ISD, you made it one of the process, uh, process factors and then, or or maybe a means, and then I, I have a saying is that, that training is not, I always say my sentence is like this, uh, training is not the end, but a means to an end. Right, yes. So the means to it, so means is one, you think ISD is one of the means, and then the end is PI, it's performance. Perf yeah, performance. I, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it. I do think that, you know, it's, it's the instruction that's the means, that systems right. design can be applied in multiple ways, and again, back mm -hmm. to Roger Kaufman and he was the first person to open my eyes to the fact that systems design can be applied to your personal life. Right. So right. I think you can apply systems design and systems thinking mm -hmm. to many mm -hmm. things. So it's the, it's the use of the term instruction that right. makes me say that we're limiting ourselves by using the term instruction. So to me, it's mm -hmm. learning and performance systems is what we're about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and also, I looked at uh, one of your interviews, uh, previous one of your previous interviews before that. You just mentioned the identity issue. The uh, you probably m mentioned the identity. Uh, one of the identity issues, like many other professions, like doctors, like salesmen, and you know, uh, law and a lawyer. So. In in their in their field in their practices they do not need to identify themselves anymore and we are as a you know instructional system design we still you know at the stage of you know somebody how Garnet has his version and then uh, David Cam has their their version and Dick and Carrie and they have their version and uh, now you have your version so we're is, in in your view is our field mature enough to have a solid definition and when sh sh uh, when will we it it is mature enough i mean you know the first obviously those things that you provided architects have been around since the you know men invented the wheel so you know we're not as mature as medicine and architect but we we are a mature enough field it depends on when you mean our field starts was it you know rita ritchie always said it said it was world war one when we began to look at you know uh people went in and did uh, time motion studies and factories. M other people say, no, it was World War II when all this stuff. So, you know, and then of course, 
you know, you can go all the way back to Plato and Socrates and say that's really the beginning of our field. So where you mean like mature, but you know, going back to the notion of systems, remember systems has self-correcting properties. And so as the world changes, our field changes, and that's part of the dynamic nature of a system. And so maybe we shouldn't ever say we know what we are. Maybe we should always be evolving. And that's a pretty cool idea, George. I never thought about that before. Right. <laughs> because because I come to the to the to the point that I look at it we and, and you were you were right when in in one of your earlier uh, recordings that that uh, that our, we, we do have a you know identity crisis and uh, and that triggered me of last triggered me of my last week's interview with Dr. Dr. Bill Rothwell and uh, he has the eleventh generations <laughs> he defined our training field eleventh generations and none of them ICDF of course ID is the field of study and he has eleven generations for for uh, training field. And that kind of uh, triggered me to think, well, maybe ISD has too. And, or maybe, maybe we also need to kind of, uh, you know, establish, uh, he, he used to have nine generations and now he developed into 11. And I, I said, maybe next year when I meet you, like maybe 12 and 13, <laughs> we were just laughing about it because you're right. And uh, because I think it is self evolving and uh, during the evolution, it does have a self a self correcting uh, mechanism there and uh, the, the system fix itself and then they keep evolving it's like one of the chaos theory you know characteristics and then it, it evolves and then comes out here and there but always it, when it when at early stages you know is, is not in the good shape <laughs> but it is growing and then later on because of external forces and uh, internal drivers and then it becomes more and more kind of a um, um, uh, a strict or a straight in this, you know, come back to the uh, resonance that it should be, it should have, you know, because of the world is components of, is, is composed of re uh, resonance. So that's the way, way I've, I look at it because I was a fan, not a super fan, but I have a lot of books of uh, theoretical, theoretical uh, physics. And I think it's, it, I mean, every field is the same. I think on, on the back end and uh, all the law of everything and and uh, um, this is so so you have been uh, been to China and uh, you have probably seen that uh, uh, which year was you what well, well, what was you uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, excuse me uh, 20, uh, which, 2011 2011 uh, that's exactly the year that uh, we started to introduce performance improvement into China officially. Uh, at that time, you know, we started to work with ISPI. Of course, earlier on in 2005, I started to bring ISPI, introduce ISPI into China. But at that time, nobody knew what was performance improvement. Nobody did. And the performance improvement is such a foreign term. Um, but uh, over the past 10 years, actually, we developed our own model and um, uh, our own model. And we wrote uh, a book out of uh, out of it, it's called uh, the theory, I mean, uh, the logic of management. So without performance management is, is more, uh, excuse, excuse me, performance improvement is more about management because we gone through a lot and it really needs to go to a next level. So we developed our model in, two, in 2011. But this is a really good lead to another question is, uh, performance improvement is very, very, uh, new to China. So you have been in the front end. So what are the current trends in the most current trends in performance improvement? Sure. Um, so I, I want to take it from the tools perspective, first of all, because I think that often that's where the, the trends mostly come from. And so the perspective of what are the tools that we're using to help enhanced performance. And I have a student right now that's doing some work in mobile performance support systems. And in multiple mobile performance support systems, there's uh, a lot of AR stuff going on now, augmented reality. And mm -hmm. so I, I see the, you know, and this is very, very true of the history of our field, as I'm sure Bob Reeser and you talked about, that 
a new tool, a new, again, I'm going to use the term tool as technology as tool here, a new right. tool comes, comes along and everybody jumps on it and they test it and they see what's going on. So some very interesting work right now being done mobile performance support with AR. Um, uh, this, uh, this, in fact, the student is from China. Her name is Yao Hong. And so she's, she's discovered some works where the farmers, farmers are using this to plant crops and it's a mobile AR device. It's just the, there's some cool stuff going on with that storage. And so I would say that that's one direction, one trend in our field. Um, in terms of the other part of the, the field, and, I, and again, I'm saying that as a process part. Um, so again, again, process tools is change management has really taken off as, I mean, it's, you know, it's no longer a fad. It's no longer a trend. There are people doing change management mm -hmm. regularly in governments and, mm -hmm. and organizations, for-profit, mm -hmm. non-profit. And, mm -hmm. and I have another student who's doing a dissertation on change management. Mm -hmm. um, it's just companies are hiring people, they're promoting people, and they're calling them change managers. And that's a, it's, it's a recent trend mm -hmm. that I'm seeing. So I say both the use of mobile performance support systems with augmented reality mm -hmm. and change management are two of the big trends I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and also, she's, she's a friend of mine, actually. We know each other. From, oh, you know? Oh, good. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, we know each other from eight or nine years ago. She was doing, um, she was, um, uh, she was sent by an American e-learning company back to China for two years, something like that. And then yeah, she, went she went over there and did an internship. Um, right. Yeah. And that's, in fact, the, the guy who was running that group uh, is a Florida State grad also. Oh, great. great. Yeah. Yep. And before that, she was with International Papers, I remember. Yep. 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 And uh, so that's great. And so, so in, uh, what you're, you, you're saying that the, the current uh, trend in performance improvement is more combined with technology. Uh, well, like, yes, I think that I think that from the again, if, if I'm thinking about the sort of the two sides of the field, right, and technology as tools, right, then I think mobile performance support augmented re with augmented reality. If I'm thinking right. about the other part of the field, the process part, like the you know the uh, generic model of performance improvement, or more specifically looking at the ISPI model or the ATD model. The one area I think that is becoming that's that's in the forefront and the trend area, as you're talking about, is that change management. The idea that people are now constant consciously trying to facilitate change mm -hmm. by following change management strategies. And that's right. what Jeff Phillips, my other student, is doing. In fact, I have an EDD student that's examining change management in the medical school here at Forest mm -hmm. State. And so change management has really become to the forefront of current thinking in performance improvement. That's great. That's great because what we that's my from my personal practice that uh, we have been doing that uh, uh, is is one way of is one form of well, change management. Actually, we change from the very top to the uh, is a more systematic change. It's a systematic alignment of every. Of everything uh, from the top level to the mid, mid man, middle management to the frontline managers and uh, and frontline employees. So th that's great. That's great. And also uh, back to the ISD. What do you think uh, that I just asked you the question of the current trends of performance management and uh, and that you summed it up. One is one side is technology, the other side is change management. Uh, the technology side is more like the AR and the the application of current technologies and also future technologies as well. But back to ISD, what do you think are the biggest challenges nowadays facing? So, right. so you, we were talking about challenges and the idea that David Merrill talked about is there's so many people out there called designers by assignment that are not mm -hmm. trained and uh, that, that continues to worry me that there's people, you know, going back to your analogy earlier, you don't find physicians who aren't trained to be physicians and have degrees in medical right. schools. Right. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Of course, there's, there's non-traditional medicine, there's traditional medicines, 
uh, there's Eastern medicine, there's Western medicine, but you get the point. You don't call yourself a physician usually unless you've been trained as a medical doctor. There's a lot of people out there. My wife is a consultant who has a master's degree in our field and she deals day to day with people who are in the field who are learning they call themselves learning experts who are basically ex content knowledge experts and i think that's a challenge to our field i believe in communication among and between cultures and communities and that and i see that across the world we have become more nationalistic, not only in the United States, but Europe. Um, this concerns me. And I think that's a challenge to our field because if, if, if our governments are gonna put barriers in place for us to be able to communicate and work together, um, even from the, the point of view of our government censoring TikTok is just horribly wrong. And so, that's a challenge that I think we should all be aware of that our governments can have an adverse effect on our, our ability to work globally as the field of performance improvement. Great. Well, yeah. not so great. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. I mean, I'm, I'm real serious about that. I worry for currently, I mean, sure you and Rothwell, talked about mm -hmm. that um mm -hmm. I, I i'm very concerned about the direction not only of the united states but of our world governments right right it's it is not only um a issue at a national level it's internet is a global issue too and uh, also um So there, there are many challenges in, in both fields, the, uh, the ISD field and also in the performance improvement area. And also uh, one, of the, one of the key things that when I, when I interviewed Dr. Uh, Dr. John Keller, uh, he mentioned that, well, he's, he's very well known for ARC, ARC's model, you know, and uh, you know, with all this ISD, with all this performance improvement, we are th we're thinking, you know, um, we are in the front line, and uh, our clients are on the front line. They are they're training their employees, <clears throat> and oftentimes we, th we thought, well, we we try so hard. We use this methodology, that principle, that technology to train them, and we are praying that they're going to have the right performance. What about what if they are motivated to learn? You know, with a <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with a motivated learner, and uh, probably there's not so much <laughs> technology needed and or money spent because they're motivated to learn. So uh, that comes to a very important issue. What are the keys to motivate learners in the classroom, I either uh, or both at the uh, class, uh, the in the education arena, especially in the um, in the in the in the enterprise setting. So, you know, motivation in the in the broadest sense of the word. And so I should tell you that Keller was my major professor. So I, right. So, I mean, you have to, what is motivation? So motivation is choice plus effort. And so what we have to do as, as instructional systems or as performance improvement specialists is to assist people to make the right choices, if you will, to make choices and then to persist at those choices. Now, you know, from a, theoretical perspective we know that there's intrinsic and extrinsic rewards so i won't get into all that but you know i think from a performance improvement perspective what we frequently don't think about are what you know i'm real fond of referring to gilbert six boxes mm -hmm. and so you've got intrinsic or internal factors that impact motivation and you have external factors and often mm -hmm. we think at the external level because, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of consequences, rewards, and punishments, and then money. Leadership is another part of that. And so we have to, again, thinking like a systems person, we have to think about motivation from what are the internal things and then what are the external parts of the environment that impact that. And when I say that, choice plus effort. 
So once again, motivation is part of the larger system. Now, yes, at the instructional level, there are things that we can do to increase choice and effort. Uh, my colleague Vanessa Denon has, of course, for many years been examining how to make uh, online environments more motivating and the whole notion of communities of practice and getting people involved. So I, I, I would say that in terms of motivation, Again, we got to begin by saying, as Keller said, what's, what's the motivational problem? Just like a performance improvement specialist says, what's the problem, what are the causes, what's the motivational problem, and then what are the causes, what are the solutions? So I would, again, look at motivation systemically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. That's what all we are looking for is, uh, is, is a systematic motivation. I, I do think that motivation is a systematic issue. It's not only that one model works. And one model works is, is, that, uh, is that one model give us the guidance, but it's really a systematic effort. It needs the mechanism to motivate our learners uh, at, the, at the workplace. So that brings, uh, uh, we, we mentioned so many great names and thank you for the motivational, uh, motivational question. Uh, uh, next move, let's move on to the ne uh, next question. But before we do that, Jim, let me check with you your time. How you're doing, do you have, a, what, what time are, uh, do you have a I hard just, stop? I, yeah, I, I just uh, talked, I wrote text to my doctoral student and I told him I'll be 20 minutes late. So I've got till 10, 20 e Eastern time here. Let's get so try to get that done before that. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. No, and, uh, yep. Uh, so, um, talking about we we got we mentioned uh, FSU, the Florida State University, and your department, the program, and you just mentioned that we only have a master's degree and doctorate degree students. Is that right? We have we have a master's degree, both face to face and online we have an edd program so uh on online mm -hmm. and that's a cohort model and we have a phd which is a a residential program we also hold we also have certificates where you can get a a, a five credit uh, a five credit five courses 15 credit of 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 performance improvement certificate Mm -hmm. instructional systems design certificate and uh, uh and and uh learning technology certificate so you don't you you don't get a degree you get the certificates the master's degree the edd is in its uh second cohort right now and so essentially the difference between the edd and the phd program is well one is online one's residential the mm -hmm. other is it's a cohort model but also the EDDs do dissertations in practice, the notion of you go into a local organization. And so, you know, earlier we were talking about, um, you know, following the uh, performance improvement model. And the woman that is working with me, who is doing a change management study in the med school, is mm -hmm. looking at a, a local contextual problem where the PhD, you're trying to generalize to the greater body of knowledge. So our, uh, so uh, I, I do want to talk about our program a little bit because it is F at FS. Uh, I mean, in the in this field, uh, Florida State University is one of the is one of the uh, epic centers in our field, uh, and also mes many master thinking thinkers, uh, they. Uh, they're here and they were here before. So we have so many good students like yourself. You're, you're also a graduate of, of FSU. And uh, so I want to ask you what our program are preparing students for? Like they're a PhD graduate, they're a master's graduate. Are they going to go on to teach uh, at the universities or they're going to the business world to, to uh, train employees? We, we have a variety of, of people who go to a lot of places, George. So let's just look at it at, at, at the different degrees. So the PhD level, mm -hmm. um, so it, it's interesting over the, over the course of the evolution of the program, which we're now in its 45th year, I believe, that Florida State and Indiana University at Bloomington were the two that were, were you know, the first two programs. Um, in fact, there's an article that I wrote with Vanessa Denon in, um, 
it's training magazine or something or no it's performance improvement so mm -hmm. if you're interested you can take a look at that but um so many many phds went to business and industry and government and there were various classes like my class um many of us went to academe so it's you know, you get people, you get these tides of people that will go to academe. So now, because we have the EDD program, the, we're, we're, what our hope is that people in the PhD program will will gravitate towards becoming faculty members at, at uh, in, in university and college settings. I mean, I should say that that does happen. And now the EDD is more practitioner. So we have people getting their doctorate who are working in organizations and governmental organizations and companies, large and small as well as school administrators. Mm -hmm. We also have people like in our PhD program who are working for volunteer organizations. They are, they are, they are working um, for governmental agencies. So both, but the difference is, is that the PhD, you should want to generate new knowledge and add to the field where the EDD is a research practitioner. Our masters come from all over. I mean, we get folks, we get Singaporean military people every mm -hmm. year we get mm -hmm. um um uh, coast guard people we get right. uh, united states coast guard and navy people we get school teachers we've got uh we, we we have people who work at large companies um from um we've got people who get their bachelor's degree in psychology and have no idea how they're going to get a job so they can get a master's degree with us we have people from the HR field, they get a bachelor's degree in HRD, they come to us. And so our master's, it's very, you know, they're from everywhere, George, with a lot of different backgrounds. And we mm -hmm. do have a lot of Chinese students uh, in our program. How many currently? How many Chinese students do we currently have or how many uh, students? Currently. Ah, uh, I, I have a better number of how many, um, how many students have overall we have approximately 50 phd uh we have approximately 35 edd and approximately 120 master's students i would say that you know like i have a research interest group and those are my doctoral students that we meet every month and we we talk about research and 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 I would say I maybe a third of those people are from China. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, a lot of Chinese PhD students in our program. Great. The reason I'm asking is right now, uh, I just uh, provide you a little bit of background that there are so many uh, learning professional, learning development professionals in China. Our rough count is about uh, between one to two, uh, 10 to 20 million. Um, because there are so many companies and each company is you, you count them each company has one training person and then there will be like at least you know 20 million you know but not every company has a full-time training person but one company have, maybe have they have 10,000 trainers so if you count on that and balance that out and then probably between you know 10 to 20 million that's for sure but there are very few programs in China and uh, so we need the, the, the reason why I'm asking about this program is that we hope that, and, and you are the department chair, and uh, we, we hope that in the future there are some collaborations with our Chinese university, maybe joint programs or joint certification or certificate programs that can teach the learning and performance improvement, uh, learning performance improvement uh, professionals in China, because the market is so huge. So we hope someday FSU can have some footprints here in China to, have to establish some joint programs someday. And well, let's uh, continue, let's you and I after, you know, we continue this conversation because uh, I'm very interested in that. George. I, I tried to do something with the government of Singapore maybe eight years ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, by the, then when the attorneys got a hold of it, it just kind of all fell apart um, because, well, part of it was the government of Singapore wanted control and Florida State said, no, that's our degree. We're not going to give the government control over our degree. Right. And that's where it ended. Uh, but I'm sure these things can be worked out. It's always easier to work it out with another university. 
Right, right. Because in China, the need is is de uh, definitely there. And uh, as I mentioned, like uh, Beijing Normal University and uh, East China Normal, those are the two that stand out very, very strong. And also some other universities as well, like Shanghai Foreign Studies University. And uh, so there are universities that that we need, we probably can, you know, can I can be the bridge, or we can we can collaborate each other to 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 do something for Chinese learning professionals in the future, and that that is our hope. But uh, I continue our, my my question is what what are the characteristics uh, of our program to differentiate us from like uh, San Diego, like sure. Georgia, like Indiana? Right. So I would say again, let's 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 begin with the master's level programs because I think that's where the foundational skills get built in our field in our program, and so we think about ourselves in in three ways, if you will, is one is systems thinking, and so we we focus heavily on systems thinking. Now, when I say that, we have macro and micro systems. And so you'll take a course on systematic instructional design where you design a module. That's where you learn Dick and Carrie, because again, that's our, you know, our forefathers and that, it, right. right? And so you'll, you'll, you, now it's not just Dick and Carrie, but those are the people who kind of set the foundation for that. But you also take larger systems courses. I teach courses in performance system analysis. And so we look at organizational systems. We, we go into an organization and we, we study a problem or a performance opportunity and we make recommendations for the solutions, uh, you know, and so we follow, we, so again, systems thinking on top of that is database decision-making. We, we, you know, we believe in database decision-making and even at our master's level, students take courses on the collection, the analysis of data to help them make decisions. So I think that's a characteristic of Florida State University. So that's the, that's the, the you know, that, that systems area. Uh, learning technologies. Uh, one of the questions that you ask here uh, that I, on the paper about how has it, how has it changed from the days of the Gagnés and the Kaufmans and the Bransons and the Morgans and the, the Reesers and the Dicks and, you know, how has it changed? Um, I believe it's changed based on the fact that those guys, see, the reason I got hired was because they, they lost that knowledge. The people that they brought in were more learning technologies people. Now, I'll take that, now that's not fully true because there are people here that are both systems thinkers and learning technology people. But the addition of the newer generation of faculty we have a strong emphasis on learning technologies that the program did not have back in the days of the Kaufmans, Bransons, Morgans, right. Genies, the, the laundry list. And then of course, performance improvement. Um, we're all about performance improvement here. And um, so with the combination of systems thinking, database decision making, then looking at performance improvement and learning technologies. And so you can come in and you can be a generalist, and that's what I encourage people to do, or you can come in and say, while I'm getting my master's degree, I'm also gonna get a certificate. So I'm gonna focus in online learning technologies and get my certificate in that, and you do that through your electives. Or you're a generalist, and you may get come out of here and take two extra classes and get two certificates, but that's how we operate. Great, thank you. I'm I'm so glad you started with a with a master's degree uh, uh, description. And uh, the reason I'm asking is that uh, the reason I'm so glad is that we can we can provide our viewers a, a basic spectrum where they can start if they do the self self study. You know, there's a lot of people in China in front of the screen. Uh, they do not where to go to upgrade themselves to learn systematically or train themselves systematically because there's no such a programs, very few of them uh, out in the field 
in, in the Chinese market. So if they want to do it on their own, and they can follow the directions that uh, Jim just uh, provided. And I'm so glad that you covered partially the, my next question, which is very important, but I have to ask again. Uh, because uh, I have to ask you formally at FSU, there's have be, so there have been so many great names who made tremendous contribution to our field, such as Bob Morgan, Bob Ganey, Roger Kaufman, Bob Branson, Walter Dick, Bob Reeser, John Keller, and the and the, you said the laundry list just goes on. As a department chair, what do you think are the most important to maintain the program as one of the best in the world? Meanwhile, keeping the legacies of these great names? So um, when, when I arrived here in uh, 10 years ago, one of the things that Marcy asked me to do is to actually come up with a strategic plan for the department, for the, for the program. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, one of the statements we make in there about our values is that we, we, we recognize the legacy of the past and the contributions that were made by the people before us. However, I tell you a story. One of my dear friends that I went to graduate school with, uh, actually David Dick, Walt's son David, said to me, oh Jim, we're so glad you're coming back to Florida State because you're gonna bring it back to where it once was. And my reply to David was, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. We always must be forward thinking. And so we honor the past here at Florida State. And so you'll, you'll learn about, you know, Roger Kaufman's model. You'll learn, you'll follow Dick and Carey's approach. Of course, you know, Gagne sits at the right hand of God. So we make sure you learn Gagne very clearly. But we also right. include the newer thinking. It's not right. just about that. And so I, I would say we honor our past and we ensure our students get the, le we call them legacy courses, right? 5603 is the legacy instructional design course where okay. everybody learns Dick and Gary, right? And so we have some legacy courses, but that's, we, there's no going back. Okay. That's a good way to, to think it. And it, that is also a good way to term it. There's no going back and we're always moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, how do you think the, uh, that, how do you predict the pandemic, current pandemic still going on will impact our field? So one of the things I've been trying to do, George, is look at the positive impacts of things because it's so, so easy to focus on some of the negative things that are occurring. And so um, I'll tell you in my own personal life, just, just for a moment, is that I have a, a, a daughter who is a cancer biologist married to a man who's a geneticist who just had a baby and she, they live near the Philadelphia area. I have another mm -hmm. daughter working on her degree at the University of Missouri in journalism, ethics, and law. And my wife and I are here in Tallahassee. And mm -hmm. since the, the pandemic began, we have had regular family meetings on Zoom, but it's not just been meetings, we've been having game night. And you know, when the children were growing up, Sunday, excuse me, Friday night was always family night, and Friday night was usually game night. But now we're able to be in multiple places and play games. So right. the, reason I, the reason I say that is because one of the, I believe one of the positive consequences of this is, I mean, maybe Zoom's not the best tool in the world, but it's sure better than a lot of other tools that we've had. So just our ability to do what we're doing today has evolved in a positive way because of the pandemic. Um, we have a regular coffee hour here. Um, our, our Instructional Systems Student Association hosts a, a, a coffee hour every month here. And uh, I will, I'll tell you as an aside, when I was a student here, I was the president of the Instructional Systems Student Association. And so now I'm the advisor to the Instructional Systems Student Association. And, and it, it, it's, this monthly coffee hour is really, really fun. But then the pandemic hit, well, what are you gonna do? Well, you have to go online and you have a Zoom coffee hour. Now our online 
masters and EDD students are able to join our monthly coffee hour. That's cool. And so I don't want to talk about the negative impacts of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I want people to think about, do a little reflection on like what good has, has come out of that. And that's how I'll leave that, George. Thank you for put uh, such a positive spin on the current pandemic. It does change our world and uh, uh, it pushes us to go virtual and the use of uh, technology uh, even faster than we expected, probably. And it, it kind of come into emerge. I mean, uh, it's a it's a kind of immer there's immersion with technology in our lives <laughs> more more uh, faster than we expected. So uh, second to the last question, Jim. I know you are running uh, on time. Uh, so if you had a chance to start all over again, what would you have done differently? You know, I. When you say start over again, I'm going to put the question in start over again in our current environment. Okay. And I've talked with my own doctoral students about this very issue. And so when I graduated from, from school with my PhD and went to Arizona State, um, it was about publish or perish on an R1. And I was very successful at doing studies and getting published and continue to be successful. Although recently I haven't done as much because as a department chair, as you know, George, you just don't have as much time to do that. But I continue to contribute to the, to the foundational knowledge of the field. And I like that. But I'm really concerned about this push towards external funding. And I think external funding is great. Don't get me wrong. As a department chair, I'm really happy when my department of course. get funding <laughs> because then I don't have to pay for their grad assistance and everything else. So right. don't get me wrong. But if I were starting over again today, I don't know that I would look for a job at an R1, that a research intensive university, because I love teaching so much, George. I mean, that's what working with smart people every day. Um, that's the intrinsic motivator for me. I love publishing. Don't get me wrong. This notion that I see young people are required to go out and get millions and millions of dollars to support their own work, mm -hmm. that worries me because it takes away from teaching. Mm -hmm. And so if I were having to do it all over again in 2020, I probably would not apply for positions at research intensive universities. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I love, I just, it's been a wonderful career and I hope to have many, many more years doing what I do. Because, you know, um, kind of in closing in your last question that you're gonna ask, so I'll let right. you kind of ask it. So go ahead. Right, your, uh, as a closing statement, uh, do you have any advice to the young practitioners in our, in, in China, not only in China, but other developing countries in the world? Yeah. So this is sort of related to the end of the last question. So when, at the end of the day, you know, you're sitting in your grandpa rocking chair and, right. and, and you're thinking about it. It's, it's, it's all about people. Mm -hmm. It's all about the impact that you have had on other people, the, the trophies, the uh, money. I mean, I'm going to bring us back and if you'll excuse me, um, because of, Right. Roger Kaufman. Right. It's right. all about people, George. Right. Right. And also you, you also mentioned that uh, Bob Reeser was also very important in your life. And uh, he was also uh, not only help you, he, uh, he shined on your career advancement at the moment of, uh, of wonder and uh, you were, you were wondering where to go, but Bob Reeser introduced, is, is, is that true? Can you tell us a little bit about, about that as, as a closing story? Sure. Um, so I was teaching elementary school and I was thinking of, of, of becoming a, um, a university teacher. And I did not know what I wanted to be uh, what, what field I wanted that in. And so I visited all of the departments in the College of Education and 
in the School of Psychology here at Florida State University. And one August afternoon, and there was no one else in the, in the office, very hot out here in Tallahassee, I met a man by the name of Bob Reeser. And Bob, who, as you know, George, is very enthusiastic about what our field's all about, told me that this was the field I should consider, that it was um, a combination of education, psychology, and communications. And I, of course, had a degree in education. I was very interested in psychology. I was thinking about getting my PhD in psychology. And I had worked at a radio station in junior college. And so Bob's enthusiasm was the reason that I decided to get into this field. Wow. So it's, you know, in, again, you know, my closing advice mm -hmm. is it's all about people. Take the time. If he had not taken the time with me, I wouldn't be in this field. Um, right. You know, be invested in, you know, if you're a manager, be invested right. in your people. Um, right. as, a, as a faculty member, again, the best thing I do is I mentor people. I, I, I have a chance to interact with some very, very smart, committed people. And right. so my advice, whether you're in China or, or, or India or, or, or Germany, or Mexico, mm -hmm. think about the impact that you are having on people. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, also, Jim. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Especially, uh, it's all about people. Uh, we got these uh, great masters ahead of us. And uh, today is a special day. And thank you, Jim, for uh, on such a special day that you still accepted um, among your busy schedules, accepted our invitation to talk to the learning and prof performance professionals in China. And a special day that uh, our dear friend, uh, our common friend, uh, dear Dr. Roger Kaufman passed away. And, uh, but uh, we are thinking of him and uh, may him rest in peace and we'll miss him dearly and we'll keep doing what he has just started and we'll bring that to a newer level. That's a, I think that's the, the best we can do as a professional and as his friend and, and as successors to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, in, in this field is to march on. Well, thank you, George, and um, let's let's continue our relationship. I'd be very happy for us to uh, to talk again and to uh, think about how we can collaborate on something. You bet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. That's my interview with Dr. Jim Klein. Tonight, we covered a lot of topics, including what the definition of ISD, of performance improvement, and so on and so forth. We also talk about his program at Florida State Uni University, where so many legendary figures have worked and thrived. And uh, we also talk about how, with so many legacies in hand, how are they going to make it uh, carry it on for the future? So. They have their own plans and we're looking forward to it. And there are a lot of students at FSU and we hope that in the future, FSU still remains an epic center of our field. One of the epic centers of our field. Thank you, Dr. Klein. And you are the uh, fifth professor that we're, we have interviewed from Florida State. The pre previous ones we interviewed are Dr. Roger Kaufman, Dr. John Keller, Dr. Bob Branson, and Dr. Bob Reeser. And uh, we are going to have the opportunity to interview other uh, professors from FSU in the future. So stay tuned. And thank you, Jim. Thank you for all of your contribution. We look forward to work with you to hear more from you soon. Thank you. And also, I'm so glad, just to make up one point where I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to Jim and I together, uh, on behalf of all the viewers, we paid tribute to our beloved Dr. Roger Kaufman, who passed away on September 23rd, American time. Okay, next week, 
we are going to have the very honor to have another longtime friend and heavyweight in our field to be on our show. His name is Dr. Jack Phillips. If you don't know Jack Phillips, and uh, that's fine, <laughs> but you must have known there are training evaluation models, and one of the models is, is ROI methodology. ROI means st standing for stands for return on investment. He is a world uh, renowned uh, expert on training evaluation. Uh, Dr. Jack Phillips, he is also the fun he he and his partner Patty, Dr. Patty Phillips, whom we're going to interview later, are the founders of ROI Methodology, and uh, Jack himself is the chairman of the ROI Institute. They co-authored and authored so many books, more than 100 books, and published in more than 65 countries in 38 languages. And he, Jack, is also was also the president of ISPI between 2012 and 2013. During our interview next week, we're going to ask him a lot about the value of training, uh, questions around that, because this topic has been bothering or have been perplexing the training professionals throughout the world for decades, for over half a century. Does training have value? How do we prove that? How? How do we pr prove that? Can we prove that? How do we calculate return on investment? How do we calculate uh, BCR, be, uh, the benefits and cost ratio. How do we determine the value of training, et cetera, et cetera. Those century long, I mean, at least half century long questions, I think, I hope will be quenched by Dr. Jack Phillips next week. So until next Wednesday, stay tuned, stay safe. Good night, thank you, and good night.